how to be XYZ. I believe that's the topic. So mine was how to be a Jew, but I need to add to that how to be a Jew after the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. I'm a Jew born in America in 1948. Um, I love being a Jew. I am heir to a rich, wonderful tradition. And there is a dark side. It has to do with identity. It has to do with inheriting the legacy of Jewish history in Europe, which was not pretty. And I was brought up to believe that I had two enemies in particular. I mean, every, the whole world is an enemy and a threat, but two in particular. One was the German people because of what they did to us. And the other was the Arabs, as we called them, because of what they would do to us if we didn't have Israel. And I was told, I was born in 1948, the year that the state of Israel was established, that I'd been blessed to have been born at a time when my people had finally been redeemed from millennia of suffering and marginalization and slaughter. Israel was our redemption. It was the war of independence. We got this country that supposedly was an empty country full of maybe a couple of savage people with camels, but basically we came, we made the desert bloom, and it was ours. Fast forward to middle age, when I finally visit these so-called enemies, I go to Palestine and I find out that we have driven out an entire population and we're engaged in a process of ethnically cleansing an indigenous population, a beautiful, wonderful culture to make room for our so-called redemption. And I knew that there could be no redemption based on that. I found the occupation of Palestine, which was a continuation of what had really begun in 1948, which was a system, a method of ethnically cleansing anyone who was not Jewish out of the territory that had been planned back in the 30s by the Zionist leaders. And suffice it to say, I had an identity crisis. In 2009, I find myself in Ramallah, which is the uh, seat of the Palestinian government in uh, the West Bank. And I was speaking to a woman who uh, is uh, the head of, a, uh, of an NGO there, a uh, Palestinian woman, a wonderful woman uh, from an old Muslim family in Nablus, which is an old town in the West Bank. And she told me about her commute from Jerusalem, where she lives, where there's still some Palestinian neighborhoods that have not yet been carved out for Jewish greater Jerusalem. And she makes this commute with her daughter almost every day, her eight-year-old daughter. And if you've been on that road, you are accompanied the entire journey by a 25-foot high wall, thick concrete wall, which is supposed to be a security wall, but in fact is a separation wall. We call it the apartheid wall. And it's carving out uh, land for the Jewish state and taking it away from the Palestinians. And this wall accompanies you. One day her daughter, and you know eight-year-olds will come out with the damnedest things just out of the blue. One day her daughter is quiet sitting there. She turns to her and she says, Mommy, why do they make the Jews live behind that wall? Now this is a profound statement because this child does not know that the wall supposedly is to make her a prisoner, to steal her land, to humiliate her, and to dispossess her. She sees the truth, which it is my people that are the prisoners of that wall, who live behind a wall of soul-killing racism and fear. And if we don't escape from that wall, if we can't surpass that wall, go over that wall, take that wall down, we are finished as a people. It doesn't matter about Israel, no Israel. There will be no Jewish people worth calling a people if we live behind a wall. And our identity, as my identity was based growing up, is based on us and them, the enemy. Who are we and who are they and who do we fear? And by the grace of God, I crossed over that wall. I met the Palestinians. I found that not only were they not my enemy, but that they welcomed me with gratitude for coming over. They might have been angry, they might have been bitter, but they did not hate me and they did not fear me. Some years later, I was at a conference and there was a panel. And the panel was discussing the Kairos Palestine document, which is a prophetic statement by Palestinian Christians calling on the churches of the world and indeed on the Jewish people to stop sinning, to stop the occupation, to live in peace with us in a shared land. And it was a panel. 
And it was a panel where different viewpoints were expressed. And there was a rabbi on this panel. And he got up and he held up the document and he said, as a Jew, I support the Palestinian quest for liberation. This is a good document, but I cannot support it. I cannot support it because in this document, there is a call for nonviolent resistance, including legal nonviolent boycotting of products made in the state of Israel to exert pressure on the state of Israel to change its policies so that we can all live in peace. After the example of the civil rights movement in America and the movement to end apartheid in South Africa. It's been done before. It's what works. It's what Israel needs. We need to liberate both Israelis and Palestinians from the sin of apartheid in our day. He said, I cannot support this document because it tells the Palestinian story but it does not tell the Jewish story. It's all about Palestinian suffering. What about ours? What about our story? Now, I didn't have a chance to talk to that rabbi, but if I had, I would have said to him, Rabbi, you are wrong. This story that's told in this document, the story of Palestinian suffering, of Palestinian dispossession, that is our story for today. That is the Jewish story of today. The Jewish story of today is not the story of our suffering in the past, which gives us total innocence and the right to do whatever we want. Our story of today is the story of what we are doing to another people. Our story is the Nakba, what the Palestinians call the catastrophe, their Holocaust, if you will. And if we do not understand that this is our story, we are done for. And I tell you, Rabbi, that the day will come when we will be on our knees in contrition and beating our breasts in shame for what we have done. And may that day come speedily and in our times as the Jewish prayer goes. Some years later, I was uh, speaking in a church. Uh, I'd come back to the United States after my experience in Palestine. And I spoke to a lot of Christian audiences uh, who really, really appreciated hearing from a Jew the story of the Palestinians because as Christians they understood that as Christians they are called by the Great Commission, by Matthew 25, to go out and to relieve suffering, the poor, the widow, the orphan, the dispossessed. But that they felt that they could not, they did not have permission as Christians to do so because of the burden of Christian guilt about Jewish suffering. And I came and told them, listen, this is not about loving the Jewish people. This is about loving Jesus. This is about loving your faith. Do what you need to do. Even if you're called anti-Semitic, that's a damned lie. Go ahead. I'm telling you that the best way to love us is to love us the way you would love your alcoholic uncle who's asking for another bottle and the keys to the car. And there was great gratitude in receiving this. Anyway, so you know how Christians are, church people. They... Uh, they want to know where you worship, right? Well, we worship here, where do you worship? So they said, well, what's your synagogue? And you know, I wasn't prepared for the question, and I don't belong to a synagogue now. And my answer was, you're sitting in it. This is my synagogue. This is how I worship. This is my way of being the best Jew that I can be today in these times. And their, Jew, their, their jaws sort of dropped, like, we're in his synagogue? You know? But there was a, it was a Catholic church. And so I'm standing in front of the altar. And so there he is, you know, bigger than life. Crucifix, Jesus hanging on the cross. I wasn't finished yet. And I said, yes, this is my synagogue. And I know that the prophetic, visionary rabbi whose image hangs over my right shoulder would fully endorse that statement. So welcome to our synagogue. And the jaws dropped even lower. They forgot that Jesus, you know, he started his career in a synagogue, didn't he, in Nazareth, right? You know? And then they clapped. And it was not for me. It was for the significance of the moment. There was a recognition that something important was happening here. Something important was happening for Christians, for the church, for our civilization, for a new era in Jewish-Christian's relations, which was not based on Christian guilt and Jewish suffering, but on looking ahead, how do we heal the ills of the world? How do we fulfill the Great Commission? As one people, as one body, as one new synagogue, doing what he wants us to do and keeps giving us opportunities to understand. 
The Palestinian cause is such an opportunity today. And I have, by the grace of God, in the last, however much time I have left, decided to follow that. And I thank God for that. That's how to be a Jew today after the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Thank you.